might be produced sometime in the future. So I guess it'll still be conventional uh, steel making route, steel making, steel refining route. So they might come from a blast furnace using iron ore or scrap and melting scrap in an electric arc furnace. Or one might even start using uh, hydrogen in, 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 in some sort of a DRI type process, hydrogen. Uh, that we, you produce by electrolysis, for example. So remove the coke as a reducing agent here to um, uh, to really make sustainable steel. But you still have to melt it. There's a huge amount of energy involved, and you'll still have to refine it in uh, late refining, vacuum to gas, or all these refining refining uh, processes. And basically, this is what I'm going to be talking about here. So this is uh, a new module we've developed for Thermocalc. We call it the uh, process metallurgy module. And this is involved in understanding and simulating, calculating what's going on in the in these steps here on the on the liquid liquid side of the steel. So where you actually produce produce the steel before casting, forging and uh, thermomechanical processing. OK. So we've talked about CALFA databases. <clears throat> what database uh, do we use for, for these, uh, this process metallurgy? It's the oxide database. This is the database that has been around for quite a long time, but only with the release of TC Ox 9 in 2019, where we, uh, where we enter the element phosphorus. So phosphorus has only been in the database since 2019. Has this database been truly applicable to, um, to, to steel? Uh, to process metallurgy, steel making, steel refining. And so that's also basically what gave us the impulse to, to, to develop a module uh, that can simulate steel making, steel refining. So we believe now all the elements that are the most important elements are inside the database. <clears throat> Again, our uh, belief is that it's good to have one single database that includes all the relevant phases for, uh, for the process that we're looking at. So we don't really like mixing various databases or so taking the stoichiometric compound from one database, the, the oxide liquid from another database, the metallic liquid from a third database. Uh, we believe if all the phases required for a certain process are described, consistently in a single database that will improve the reliability of the of the simulation. So uh, this TCOx database includes a uh, metallic phases, so solid metal uh, and also uh, solid metal. And actually the uh, these me metal phases, they're taken directly one to one from the, uh, the steel database, the thermocalic steel database, so they're identical. It's not a complete set of the steel database that would just make the database too big. So it's just the most important phases, austenite, ferrite, uh, carbides, uh, some nitrides. Um, and then uh, we have solid oxides, which could be the refractory material, but solid oxides can also be uh, solid non-metallic inclusions in the liquid steel. Um, and then there's a gas phase because process metallurgy most mostly involves blowing some sort of a gas onto the steel or through the steel or into the steel. Or, uh, so there's a gas phase there. And the liquid phase, which is arguably the most important phase. And the uh, liquid phase is described with the ionic two sublattice model. And the advantage of this model is that it describes the steel all the way, or the liquid steel all the way from, uh, well, from metallic to non-metallic. So it, it, the, the liquid can either be a, an oxide liquid, it can even be a sulfide liquid or a metallic liquid. And typically these different types of liquids are separated by a miscibility gap, but the database can, can describe the liquid uh, all the way from metallic to, to non-metallic. So all the phases, the message here is all the phases are in one single database, and this is the TCOx database. Okay, and I'll come to some um, examples of what you can calculate, and I'll start by uh, equilibrium uh, calculations. And the first one is energy and mass balance. So this here is a sketch of an electric arc furnace where you typically melt, melt your, uh, your material. And what you do here is you, you put in scrap. So this is a sketch of scrap. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to melt it as, as quickly as possible. And so you're trying to get as much energy in there 
uh, in as short a time as possible. And, and you have electric arc heating here with these electrodes, putting with huge amount of power being uh, electrical power being, uh, being blasted into the furnace. But you can also use chemical heat. So there are there are burners that, that uh, first serve to cut the uh, the scrap into small pieces so they can have a cutting function and, and, and they also bring uh, bring in energy heat. And you can also blow oxygen and huge amounts of oxygen are blown into modern electric arc furnaces uh, together often with carbon injection. And then of course, the reaction of carbon plus oxygen is exothermal. And so you, what you're trying to do is you're getting in as much ele energy as possible in as short a time, electrical energy, chemical energy and to, to melt the materials. And this is the end state. So you've got the liquid metal at the bottom and, uh, and a slag phase. Now, important questions that equilibrium thermodynamics can answer are, uh, so for, uh, people are always talking about the amount, the electrical consumption of an electric arc furnace, so, and then 290 uh, kilowatt hours per tonne is considered an extremely good value. But of course, if you're adding huge amount of chemical energy at the same time, that's meaningless. And with thermodynamic calculations, you can sort of separate the two. You can say, how much chemical energy am I actually putting in and what sort of uh, electrical energy does that correspond to? So you can calculate the heat evolution by, by oxygen injection due to oxidization, exothermal oxidation reactions. And this results in, in cost optimization and process optimization by balancing the amount of oxygen you inject with the use of the burners and the electric arc in function of time. So, and, and th there's a lot of, again, this is, uh, can be very powerful. And another thing people are doing is preheating the scrap. So with various methods using the off gas, for example, you can he heat the scrap up to maybe a couple of hundred degrees Celsius and a thermodynamic calculation will tell you exactly how much energy you're saving by doing that. The next uh, thermodynamic calculations, equilibrium calculations you can perform are investigate what's happening to the chemistry of your steel and I always argue that the two most important things that a process metallurgist needs to do is he needs to remove phosphorus and he needs to remove sulfur. Now, the, because these are both detrimental for the uh, final product in most cases. Um, now, the problem here is that phosphorus is removed by oxidation. So for, the way you remove phosphorus is you oxidize it to P2O5 in the steel, the liquid steel. And this oxide is lighter and you can float it up and uh, combine with the slag phase. The problem with uh, is that that uh, sulfur is exactly the other way around. It requires reducing conditions. So you've got uh, sulfur dissolved in the steel here and you need to to move the uh, the sulfur from the steel into the slag phase as calcium sulfide, you need reducing conditions. So if you just look at the oxygen, the oxygen is in the right side of the equation here. Introducing conditions will pu push this equation to the right, and oxygen is on the left side of this equation here. So, re ox uh, or reducing conditions will, will push this equation uh, th the wrong direction. And this is a result of a cal calculation using the TCOX database, and this shows exactly what's happening. So, as you, uh, what I've got here is the equilibrium between a liquid steel and a slag phase. And what I'm doing is I'm changing the, the oxygen potential, basically. So one could argue that I'm adding oxygen. So here I've got no oxygen and I just blow oxygen into the steel and see what happens with the chemistry of the steel. And obviously, as I add oxygen, the oxygen content in the steel increases. But you can see that the phosphorus content here decreases. So the phosphorus is being moved from the steel to the slag, exactly what I want to do. However, the sulfur goes exactly the other way. OK, so to to have a low sulfur content, so there's the, the content of the y axis here to have a low sulfur content and then you reduce in conditions. And and this here is actually the reason why steel plants are, are made the way they are. So typically you have a first oxidizing stage in the steel plant, which is your uh, steel making. It can be a converter or an electric arc furnace and then a second uh, steel refining that's done under reducing conditions. That will be your ladle furnace, your vacuum degasser. OK, um, yeah, I'll, I'll move through these very quickly. So what's a good uh, good slag uh, to dephosphorize and desulfurize? Well, every metallurgist will tell you this composition here, but why? So what, uh, what's the definition of a good slag? So 
two things basically. It has to be able to absorb the sulfur that's dissolved in the steel. So that's uh, the first thing it has to do. But the second thing it has to do, it has to be liquid. And using the process metallurgy module calculations like this that can be very, very complex, have complex chemistries and be complicated to set up, can be done very, very simply. So what I, I calculate here is uh, I, I vary the slag composition from pure calcium oxide here, increasing the silicon content on the x-axis, increasing the aluminium content on the y-axis, and I have contour lines. And the red contour lines tell me if, the, if that slag for this composition is actually liquid or not. And down here, if it's pure lime, it's fully solid. And this is useless because it'll just float as an island on top of my steel and will not react with the steel for kinetic reasons. And only if I'm in this region here, will it be fully liquid? So that's the first condition that the slag has to have. Now, the second contour lines I plot are the amount of sulfur remaining in the steel. And if I have a slag content, uh, composition up here, you can see that the uh, sulfur in the liquid steel is zero, 0 0.08, so exactly what I had at the beginning. So this slag has, a, has no uh, very poor sulfur capacity. It's not absorbing any of the sulfur whatsoever. So it's, it's basically useless. It's passive. But only if I change the composition down here uh, will it absorb the sulfur. And then you get this sweet spot here, which I marked in red, where the slag is both liquid and has good sulfur capacity, so is able to absorb the sulfur out of the steel like a sponge. And, and this is so a calculation like this, no matter how complex your steel chemistry and slag chemistry is, a calculation like this will tell you what sort of slag you need to use for your, your process. Okay, I'll uh, move on, I'll skip these for time reasons. Now, what I've shown up to now is equilibrium calculations. Now, these are very important to get a fundamental understanding of what's happening. But unfortunately, uh, steel making, steel refining does not reach thermodynamic equilibrium. So how can we introduce kinetics into our calculations? So the way we do it is with this, we call it, or it has been called in literature, it's not our invention, the effective equilibrium reaction zone model. And what we assume here is that we have basically a slag, maybe of this composition here, and a liquid steel. And they're not in equilibrium, and they're just beside each other, basically. And we can calculate the equilibrium here, and let's assume that it's a purely liquid slag and a liquid steel. And then what we assume is that a small part of this slag close to the interface with the liquid steel on which it's floating will reach equilibrium. And likewise, a small fraction of the liquid steel will reach equilibrium. So that's what we do. We split off a small part of the slag plus a small part of the, of the liquid steel. And this is what we call the effect of equilibrium reaction zone. And then we assume this composition here reaches equilibrium. And uh, well, and then we, uh, we, combine, we, we just uh, mix this here. Uh, compute the equilibrium and typically the result of that equilibrium calculation will be an oxide liquid and a, and a metallic liquid with a different composition than the bulk slag remaining here and the bulk steel remaining here and then we just mix the two up here and uh, basically then we've moved one step closer to equilibrium and the size of the this slice here that you cut off the bigger you make that per time step the faster the kinetics so it's an incredibly simple model, but it's been shown already from, it's been around for a while, for 10 years, at least 20 years almost. And it's been shown to be very, very powerful at, at actually introducing kinetics into uh, steel making, steel refining. And now what can we do with that? So we, we, the, well, with that simple model, we can then really start simulating true steel making, steel refining processes. So if you look at how steel is really made, uh, the deoxidization, for example, is not done by adding aluminium to a, to a, to a, to a big ladle of steel. No, there is a, a strict sequence of additions, alloying additions that you make to the steel in function of, of, of for example, here tapping. So, so when you start tapping the steel from the ladle furnace, uh, from the electric arc furnace into the ladle, there's the tapping stream, then you start by adding carbon. This will deoxidize uh, the steel and will result in high carbon content here. You 
then add the slag formers at a later stage, but still quite early. So you're using this turbulence in this process for the uh, slag to intimately mix with the steel and result already here in uh, de desulfurization. And you add the ferro alloys later. And the reason you do that is often these are more expensive than carbon. So you're you're protecting these by already having the, uh, the steel deoxidized at an early stage. And by the way, also the slag formers, adding these before deoxidizing is, is a very bad idea because then the, the steel will still have high oxygen potential and the slag won't be active, won't desulfurize the steel as we've seen previously. So there's a strict sequence of when these uh, alloys are being added, and there's a reason for that. And having a kinetic simulation allows us really step by step to um, to simulate what's happening in function of these, uh, these two minutes during this tapping uh, tapping procedure. And there are other things that are happening, and I'll be talking about these as well. So these are things that are, won't appear anywhere in your steel making recipe and, and steel plant people have very little understanding of what's actually going on here. So when, while you're tapping, uh, oxygen will be entrained. The, these are these bubbles here. And this is, of course, very harmful. And, and, and you try to, well, it's not measured anyway in, in any place. But once you start doing the simulation, you see that this uh, oxygen entrainment is absolutely necessary to be able to reproduce what your, ex, uh, what your experiments are telling you or, or, or is happening in function of time in your steel. And uh, the second thing that we call a free parameter is slag carryover. So it's very difficult to prevent slag from entering the, uh, the, the ladle from the electric arc furnace. And uh, it's not measured in any way. It's, uh, but again, doing the simulations, you can see that it's very important to, uh, to consider this. So these sort of simulations can be done for all sort of different steel grades. High spring steel has one sort of recipe, tire cord, a different recipe, low carbon aluminium killed, again, a different recipe. And you can perform these simulations and see if the sequence that you, you might just be doing without really understanding why you're doing it is the optimal sequence or if, uh, if it can be improved in any way. And I mean, we've seen that this simple model is very, very powerful at, uh, at simulating even complex processes like the uh, vac vacuum oxygen decarburization process for, for stainless steel uh, pr production. So a complex uh, procedure where you start with, a, with, with an oxidizing stage and then a, a vacuum degassing stage where you're changing uh, pressure. And a third stage where you then add deoxidizing agents to to reduce the pressure, and uh, yeah, and and there are similar uh, publications uh, on this method that also give. Um, it sounds as if time's up. I've got two more minutes. I'm almost at the end. And so we've benchmarked our simulations with uh, results coming from literature, and <clears throat> again, this is for uh, stainless steel. This is from the publication, and you can see here this the chromium content in the in the steel, and um, in the first oxidizing stage here, the chromium content in the steel is uh, decreases because you're oxidizing the chromium and moving it to the slag phase, and this is of course what you don't want because uh, the chromium is expensive, so you have to recuperate it, and this is what the st second stage is for. So here the the chromium content increases again. As you uh, as you uh, as you decrease the oxygen partial pressure by adding deoxidizing agents, and uh, the slag shows the opposite uh, behavior. So chromium content increases as chromium moves to the slag, and then decreases slowly. And we're able to simulate and reproduce this one to one. And we have uh, uh, detailed write-ups exactly on how to do it. And it's uh, this is just a screenshot to show how simple it is. You just add the process in tabular form. Click calculate. A simulation will take 30 minutes, and you will get as a result. In this, this case, it's the temperature. So this uh, temperature evolution during your process in function of time, and uh, closely matching what other people have uh, simulated and and measured. Okay. And now this is the, the very last thing I'd like to show. <clears throat> where where do we go from here? So. In a typical steel plant, uh, you've got plant one, a level, level one automation that tells the steel plant what to do. And there are a lot of measurements coming out of the steel plant that are stored in the plant level two, two system. 
and and this this huge great big collection of data this is what people doing for example artificial intelligence tap to uh, and look at to try and find correlations but we believe <clears throat> to improve the process but we believe there is a huge yeah. amount of added value at not artificial intelligence but real physical model where you take into account physical models and calfa type databases to to understand your process better and this is what we're working on so we call it a digital twin of the steel plant uh, process and what we do here is we take uh, plant level two data directly and then uh, feed it into the uh, process metallurgy module and that will give you basically it will tell you what the steel plant's doing and we've written a little uh, translator program that's so these processes are often so complex it's not possible to add every, all the steps by hand so this translator program takes data directly from the level two uh, system that typically has a timestamp and an event so it could be for example at quarter past 10 at night 645 kilograms of lime was added from bunker one for example uh, so we take this information in tabular that's typically tabular form in the level two system and uh, make uh, a process simulation file that's readable by thermocalc and then we can actually calculate what this event in the steel plant what effect that's going to have on the uh, on the process so this is what we're working on now it's a work in progress uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, finish and conclude. I'll just give you four of the most important, my important takeaways from it's been very interesting work developing this. Uh, so it's a very simple model, this EERZ, but it seems to be adequate. And it seems for real industrial process, we really need to have an automatic generation of calculation files. Everything else is good for uh, general purposes, but need they need to be automatically generated because industrial processes are just too complex to handle manually the other thing is free parameters so there are things happening in steel plants that nobody's measuring which is oxygen entrainment and slag carryover and these are required otherwise you don't understand uh, your results you can't interpret them and the final thing is equipment performance. So if you have a simulation like this, you can really one-to-one -one compare. If you have, for example, two ladle furnaces, you can compare one-to-one -one how they're performing, uh, one compared to the, to the other. So one might be from supplier one, uh, the other might be from a different supplier, and you can really immediately see by what the difference is because you've got so much data and so much measurements, how, how well uh, your equipment is performing if you benchmark it against each other.